You're working on a project at Peace Health Labs with an interesting goal, to conquer our technology paradox. What is the paradox? Well, the paradox is really this um, you know, recognition that each decade, or almost over the weekend, we seem to reinvent our world in, in terms of the technology solutions that are available. But in the healthcare industry, we really see that every single decade, our populations are less well than they were previously. And that, to us, is a complete paradox. It, it's as if our biology has no respect for our ability to digitize our world. And how is the project approaching the problem? What kinds of solutions have you come up with? Well, what we recognize is that we're the traditional medical model is basically out of date. We're no longer accidentally well. Uh, our parents lived at a time when their parents didn't have to know how to feed their children. They, they didn't have to know how to move their children. Everybody, in a sense, achieved a level of health and um, that they didn't really s expressly set out to earn or deserve, and that doesn't exist today for our children. So what we really need to understand is how to use technology to deliberately design the ways in which we live in our communities to optimize our health. You used a term accidentally well. What, is that, what does that mean? Well, basically, uh, as I mentioned, that there was no deliberate effort to feed children properly or to have them uh, achieve the right amount of movement. Now we're seeing that children are more and more sedentary and the ability for things like refined carbohydrates or trans fatty acids to displace the whole foods from the diet is more and more prevalent. And what methods are you using to gather this personal data for the, to track the, the people you're looking at? So what's, beauty, you know, what's easy about accidentally well is that the high yield health contributors are very low risk, such as movement, nutrition, sleep. And for those um, parameters, the sensors are simple and low cost. We used an accelerometer at Peace Health to track our employees' movement over a six month study and uh, wireless weight scale. And then there are more and more sleep options available as well. So very much like the, the things that the mass market are using, Fitbits and Jawbones and things like that. Exactly. But I think they're still promoting those technologies as a sort of for you model. Like, Jen, you should use this for you. Mm -hmm. And what we've been looking at in this work is really how to change that dynamic so that it's not just a for you model because basically you'll be fatigued uh, at looking at your own data over and over again. But uh, really a model where we provide a compelling reason to participate that is enduring over time. And so as personal health data tracking becomes more mainstream, what role do you see it playing in the future of medicine? Is it going to become a part of treatment and prevention? Absolutely. I think we keep talking about personalized medicine and to a large degree that still is focused on gene disposition. But in fact, a large portion of your health, of course, is, is determined by how you use your genetic material through the decades of your life. And so personalizing your risk for any of the adverse health outcomes, cardiovascular disease, disease diabetes, and so on, will depend upon how much of a movement have you tracked throughout your decades of your life, how much nutritional exposure have you had that has been either promoting good health or uh, the converse. And as data becomes a larger and larger part of all aspects of healthcare, from research to personalized treatments you were talking about, privacy concerns are emerging. I realize this is a huge, complicated topic, but what sorts of solutions do you envision to address the privacy issues? And will part of it involve a shift in the way people view their personal data? Yeah, this is a bit of a longer answer. <laughs> <laughs> the way we've approached the, the privacy and security is, first of all, in terms of getting the data. Right now, if you sprinkled sensors in the community, you wouldn't get any data. Um, it uh, is very difficult to have um, you know, movement, sleep, nutrition come in uh, in an enduring way from a diverse community. So what we've done is enlisted uh, the help of our youth. We find the youth uh, as having a skill surplus digitally 
kids can uh, you know, scan apps all day and tell you which app you need and which app I should use. They also have this ability to pick up any sensor and figure out what it does and even adjust the user preferences. And then the um, third thing, of course, kids do is push out two, three hundred messages a day without it interfering with their workflow in any way. So with our work, what we've done is um, specifically connected youth to seniors in our community or what we would, um, replacement for seniors is just our employees uh, because they are much less digitally savvy than our, the youth are in the community. So we use the U of O students to connect with our employees and teach them how to download free apps and how to participate with sensors. And we find that that's the way to get the data into what we're calling the community data commons. And then back to your question about privacy and security. We think in the future, if we streamline options for privacy and security so that as a community member, my data always only goes to the community data commons, that that's a route that I trust, know, and love. That provides me a mechanism by which I don't have to make an assessment of every vendor that's trying to sell me something. And this community data commons, is that like an open source tool? Or right, that's what we would expect it to be. But regulated? Well, regulated by the, an ombudsman type of approach where the community members, the students, the professors, the savvy community members all see in a transparent way how that data is being used and who is accessing that data. So it's kind of a crowdsourcing tool. Right, and it's, it's kind of built with the expressed intent to unite two generations against a common evil. In the U.S., we use tuition fees. So instead of the student saying, Jen, give me your wallet for tuition fees, uh, the student saying, you're sleeping anyway. Why don't you give me your sleep data? Well, I'm doing a project on campus. And if you, I'll show you how to use this sensor. And then over time, I'll show you where your sleep is on the internet and whether you're on in the top of your group or the bottom of your group. Over time, you might be interested in understanding if perhaps movement is associated with your ability to sleep well. And again, the student can act as your technology mentor, offer you a, an accelerometer to track your uh, movement as well as your sleep. And so we see this uh, cross-generational collaboration model as the foundation of sustainable societies. Because as the older population leaves the planet, they're leaving with them a vast amount of wealth in terms of their health expression that in a world where we're no longer accidentally well really needs to be handed off efficiently, effectively, and in an open way to the generation behind. That's really interesting. So shifting directions just a bit, what are you finding particularly interesting these days? What people and projects are you following? Well, what I find so exciting is all of this sort of excess human asset that's on the globe today. We have uh, empty seats in cars, such as Blah Blah Car, um, you know, Airbnb. The beds exist already. We never had a way of utilizing them safely before, and now that's existing through internet and crowdsourcing approaches. So I find that very exciting and see a future where today our uh, health experience is basically often um, just evaporates, it's gone. We don't capture it in useful ways and I think that that's another human sort of asset that we're going to be able to utilize the internet and open source approaches to, to make much more value for each other in the long run. Well, thank you very much for talking with me today. Thanks, Jen.